with us, ma'am, uh, Ms. Ela Rai, Assistant Professor, IMT College of Management, who gave us an insight on the uh, role of emotional intelligence in the education sector. Uh, in addition, we had Mr. Malik uh, Rashid Faisal, Assistant Regional Director, IGNU Regional Center, uh, Delhi, who shared with us his acumen on the use of uh, online videos and live streaming in uh, education. So, uh, progressing with the learning process, uh, it is my heartiest pleasure to introduce our speaker for the first afternoon session, uh, Dr. Tithi Bhatnagar. Uh, Dr. Tithi Bhatnagar is currently working as an Associate Professor and Deputy Director, Center for Leadership and Change. Uh, she is responsible for professional and teachers training programs conducted at the Jindal Institute of Behavioral Sciences, OP Jindal Global University. She has trained around 7,000 plus teachers, students, government officials and executives on topics like uh, understanding stress, performance enhancement, multiple intelligence, work-life balance, effective decision making, um, motivation at workplace, and uh, many, many more. Uh, she's a psychologist by training and a well-being and happiness researcher and teacher by profession. Uh, her doctoral research was in the area of subjective well-being from the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. Uh, her professional experience is a mix of industry, freelance consulting, academics, training, and advisory roles. She has been a resource person for various faculty development programs and is a member of the American Psychological Association, the International Society of Quality of Life Studies and the Academic Council of United Nations. Ma'am, I welcome you on behalf of IMT College of Management and request you to kindly start with a session on role and importance of a positive education. Thank you so much for that generous introduction, Pravneet, uh, and a very good afternoon to all of you. Pleasure being here and thank you for having me. So I'll share my screen and we can start right away. <clears throat> so is the screen visible? Uh, yes, ma'am, it is. Great. All right. So I am going to talk today about something which is not a hardcore technological space, but I am going to talk about something which is extremely important for us to understand when we are moving into this fast changing scenario of today, which has a lot of technology, which has a lot of information overload. And you know that the internet, internet is full of information. So what is the role of a teacher is something that we need to either remind ourselves very often or we need to keep revisiting or we need to learn. So on that note, I would like to begin today's session because it's important for us faculty to talk about these concepts. I'm going to talk about role and importance of positive education. Now you must be wondering what is this positive education or are we talking about, you know, the, I mean, are we talking about things that sell like hotcakes? So there's a lot of happiness, there's a lot of uh, we keep talking about concepts like happiness, subjective well-being, and everybody's talking about them. So are we talking about something like that? Yes and no. Why yes and why no? So here is the explanation. Now the thing is that when we talk about educational space, right from times immemorial, we know that education is not the knowledge and the information that we gather, right? Education is about translating into the application, the knowledge, the information that we have. Are we able to process it in the right manner that can help us lead a better life? Technology is also such a thing where it is for the betterment of human race, right? So we technology should be for us. We should not be for technology. But in the changing scenarios and in the fast changing space of the agile world today, we are somewhere becoming a little confused with our concepts and that's why it's very important for us to go back revisit some concepts right so we are not talking about the fancy or the popularity contest term called positive we are talking about something which can help us teachers to strengthen ourselves as well as to cater to the requirements of the students to help them understand the information we are giving them to process it in a manner where they can use it wisely they can apply it in their day-to-day -day lives to become better so we are talking about positive education today and when i saw this um, opportunity i felt that you know where everybody would be talking about maybe science delivery content 
I would want you to know that there is something at the base of everything. And if you are coming from that perspective, it would be very easy for you to actually come up with curriculum, design curriculum, embed these concepts into your curriculum where both the faculty, the educator and the student gets benefited. <clears throat> so just to give you a brief about this whole positive education movement, uh, this began with uh, Professor Martin Seligman, who is also known as the father of positive psychology and his colleagues. So they were working on, you know, they were working with school population. They were working with school children and they were working on the concepts of flourishing, human flourishing, where we can actually utilize our strengths and we can deliver optimally. So what happened was that they realized that this entire field of positive psychology was born because they realized that for every one positive study, there were 17 studies which studied negative states with studied pathology. And that was not helping us because we were moving only in the realm of how to navigate, how to avoid pain, but we were not generating something which was value added, which was positive enough to actually give us a lot of happiness, give us a lot of fulfillment, give us a lot of, you know, help us experience that flow, which is uh, Professor Csikszentmihalyi's concept, the theory of flow, right? So they gathered together and they started studying several aspects in this field and that's how the field of positive psychology emerged so positive education is a very important aspect because here what they did was they started studying school children and that is how the field was born and they realized that if there are concepts these life skill concepts like well-being strengths uh, meditation or mindfulness for that matter if they are embedded into the course curriculum students perform much better students are able to handle stress well and students are able to actually become better more responsible and happy citizens for tomorrow right so moving on so exactly what is positive education it's the systematic application of these principles and practices so that what can be facilitated the interpersonal and the intrapersonal learning and why so that it can increase academic social and emotional well-being of the educator as well as the educated so that is the stream of positive education and it is important for us to understand this so if we look at you know what is it promising us so like i told you there are several benefits but the most important benefits are the life skills that you're teaching your students so it, if you integrate these into these principles and practices into your academic curriculum, it has the power to dramatically improve your students' achievements and well-being levels. So what are the five most important things if you look at? It teaches you to stay optimistic. Your students become more positive oriented. Their approach is more positive towards life. They have a growth mindset rather than a fixed mindset. They are more solution focused, right? Then there's this very interesting concept which is called delayed gratification. And I'm sure emotional intelligence much, must have touched upon it. So if you know this marshmallow experiment, it is a very interesting experiment where you know it was done with kindergarten kids and the teacher gave them marshmallows and she told them that if they will not eat till she comes back, they will get one more. And it's a very interesting, uh, you know, way of looking at this phenomenon. So it was like there were some students who could hold themselves. There were some students who just couldn't hold themselves. They saw the marshmallow, they ate it. And the teacher did reward the students who waited. And then a follow-up study was done, you know, a longitudinal study where these students were followed throughout the years. And it was proven that these kids who had delayed gratification, they were more controlled. They were more calm, composed. And these were the students who performed better in life. Whereas the students who were more into instant gratification, 
they were more prone to becoming victims. They were more prone to criminal activities. So if you see this delayed gratification is a very important concept. And as we say, you know, you should not teach children values. You should teach children to value values. How would students, I mean, if you tell them, see, this is good, this is bad, don't cheat. If you do, plagiarism will give you a zero, right? If you're more punitive in your approach, if you're more, you know, you do something, you get a penalty, you get punishments. If this is the approach versus imagine the approach where you are actually playing from their strengths, you are motivating to, you know, have that heart change within themselves where they transform themselves for the betterment. So those are the things that are very critical and very important. So if you teach values, they will just do it for the sake of doing it, but they'll not imbibe it. They will not internalize it. And for them to do that, it is important that they start valuing values. So they don't do things because they are supposed to do that. They do things because they should be doing that. What is the benefit in that? They should be able to see that, right? Likewise, strengthening willpower. Willpower determination can move mountains, right? We say man has the power to move mountains and so has so women, right? Women, we're talking about a general neutral language here and also connotations. So strengthening of the willpower, this is ex also extremely important. And this is what your positive education would do to your students. Increasing resilience. What is resilience? Resilience is the quickly bouncing back after a setback, right? So if you've had a setback, you just don't sit, lament over it, languish, but you actually boom up again and you try to go for what you want to achieve, right? So it increases your resilience and resilience is also something which is extremely important because life is full of surprises. And in order to cater to them, in order to navigate them, in order to win them, we need to be resilient, right? And finally, important to build meaningful social relationships and find greater meaning and satisfaction. Because this science is not talking about thinking about you less, right? Or thinking that you are lesser. This science is about playing from your strengths and also looking at many others who are involved so it's not you know it's the same indian ancient indian wisdom with, which talks about vasudev kutumkam we are not talking about a self who is confined into only individual needs individual gains but a self who is an extended self so i am happy when my family is happy when my friends are happy right i'm an extended entity i'm i am an extension of my relationships my significant others, my important relations, right? So that is why this science again becomes very important because it promises us to give that and find, of course, greater meaning and satisfaction. Life has to have meaning. I mean, we should know what is our purpose? What is our life goal? Why are we here? What are we doing, right? So we should have answers to these questions and that can only come from reflection. So if we look at it, what does it focus? You know, what are the correlates? Optimal learning, it, there is sufficient research evidence which tells that learning is enhanced when the classroom module is positive education based, right? So you learn more because there's lesser stress. There is no anxiety, right? You are playing from your strength. Sometimes learning becomes fun because of that. So it results in increased positive emotions, strengths, relationships, purpose, accomplishments, right? Students also obtain these life skills and life skill is what is most important. Degree will not ascertain that we are going to live a good life, right? But these life skills are what will ascertain that we are going to lead a good life. So, I mean, let's take this example. Uh, we all know Hitler, right? We know that the engineers who made gas chambers, they were a marvel when it comes to sciences and engineering. Can you tell me why? Anybody? Anybody? Can you tell me why? I'm saying that 
these were a marvel uh, in sciences and engineering the gas chambers could anybody tell me why all right oh i also think that maybe uh, the you are muted and cannot anyways okay so uh, the thing is that they were a marvel because not once they had an incident of gas leaking out of the chamber not even once right but they were they a marvel according to humanities they were a disaster they were a disaster because look at what they did to people how can we do that to our own people who teaches that who tells us that right so if we just go by the material world we are not thinking we are not paying atten attention to how are we designing things how are we engaging people what is it that we are transmitting or we are imparting sharing with the new generation we will never understand so when we teach that they were a marvel from the engineering point of view it's imperative upon us to also teach that they were a disaster when it comes to humans and humanitarian issues right so those are the things that are taught because you teach about values you teach about virtues you engage into those kind of conversations so the child also learn or the student also becomes a more responsible accountable citizen of tomorrow and they understand that anything that they do doesn't confine to themselves alone it has implications for many others who are also part of the system right all the stakeholders are taken into account so there are number of things that when we talk about positive education we also look at those things one is of course seligman's perma model right we are going to talk about these models the character strengths right what are your uh, basically what are you good at you should be aware about your own strengths and what are the kind of combinations that can actually help you to achieve right growth mindset when we say growth mindset that means you do you are not fixed on your ideas you are open enough to experiment to explore and you have a solution focus so you don't look just at the problem but you look at the solution as well right and the final thing that we talk about is restorative practices what are these so for example you know if somebody has gone through a catharsis or a crisis we as faculty we as educators we do not actually so for example your student is not coming to the class or your student is not submitting the assignments what do you do so there are two th two ways of looking at the situation you just scold the uh, to uh, you know you just scold the student you give them some pen penalty or punishment or you take interest you get you sit down with the child you talk to the child or the student right i mean we're talking about higher education institutions so let's say students we talk to the students we try to find out what is troubling them we may talk to the parents if required and we actually help the student to come out of the problem situation and focus more and try to give in the best so those are the restorative practices that we can engage in right are our models those kind that's a question for reflection for all of us so if you look at the perma model the p e r m a is an acronym and it stands for p for positive emotions e for engagement using strengths relationships meaning and accomplishment now when we look at uh, this science of well being right i mean if it's if we talk about it from point of view of a generic understanding of well being we are talking about aspects of a life which are responsible to help us you know to make us fully functional to help utilize everything that is our strength to optimally function to optimally make sense of our life right so uh, according to seligman seligman these are the five important aspects positive emotions engagement using strengths so you know you experience that flow when you are engaged when you are playing from your strengths right if i'm good at something i'm doing that 
I am a very good artist. I am a painter, right? And when I'm painting, I forget the world. I forget to eat. I forget to drink. So for me, that time is well spent. I don't even realize it is work. I am not tired. I am not fatigued. I'm so full of energy when I'm doing that, right? Why? Because it is, I am playing from my strengths. Those strengths are being matched by my skill sets and some creative thing is coming out of that. Likewise, our relationships. Any country, I think irrespective of the culture, irrespective of the finance, the GDPs, any country will have relationships as the topmost well-being determinant for them. Because we all are hum we human beings are designed in a manner where we need that kind of emotional support from people, right? Meaning is something very important. We cannot we if we are living a mundane life where we wake up in the morning, every day 7 a.m. we do one thing, 8 a.m. we do another thing, 10 a.m. we do another thing, and that's the routine Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday through Sunday. Then life is monotonous, boring. Nobody can live like that. So we need to understand what is that thing which provides meaning to our life. First of all, we'll need to understand what is it that we want from life? Who are we? So if we understand, we will teach our students to understand that. And that is something up. Uh, that's the application part of the PERMA model, right? And likewise, accomplishments, because we need to also have a sense of achievement. We need we, there is a need, right? We all know McClellan's three needs, right? So Parma says these are the five important aspects of an individual's life which will aid into them experiencing high levels of well-being. So how does Parma model apply to positive psychology practices and what are the lessons for success, right? So this table is a very good summary of those. So if we look at positive emotions, we are basically teaching students to live a pleasant life, right? So they experience those good things. They savor those good memories. They are grateful for those good memories. They are experiencing that short term happiness from different things. It could be as trivial as, you know, a, the teacher said good to me today, right? And what are the positive psychology lessons for success? This is all related to feelings. If you're feeling positive, you're more hopeful, you're optimistic, you're motivated, you want to perform more, right? Then we talk about positive engagements. That's about the good life. So now what are you engaging in? What are the activities that you are involved in, right? And you feel that your life is good. You're contributing, you're making sense. So this is about playing from strengths. When we talk about relationship, we are talking about connections, right? We're talking about quality relationships. We're talking about friendships. Yes, yeah, ma'am. Yeah. Sorry to bother you, ma'am, in between. No, no. But ma'am, I think your presentation is not moving. It is on the first page itself. Oh, oh. I suppose. Yeah. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Now it's yes, yes, yes. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, sure. And is the screen full or is it? Yes, ma'am, it's full screen. Okay, great. Okay. Thank so, you, ma'am. Right. So yeah, uh, so when we are talking about relationships, we're talking about connections and it is about our quality relationships and friendships. When we talk about meaning, we are talking about a purposeful life, a life which, which is not wasted. Now, who will teach all this to the next generation? It is our duty as educators. It is our responsibility as educators to pass on this to the next generation. So of course, parents do play a role, but then they are with us most of the time, and it is imperative for us to do that. And this is about contribution. Are you adding any value, right? What, why did you live? What did you do when you came to this earth? So those are the questions. So, you know, reflection becomes extremely important because reflection is what will lead them to think about these things, and therefore they will get engaged into these things further. Finally, we talk about positive accomplishments. So we are teaching about contentment. That talks about contentment, right? So how, what is the meaning of winning? It's a very concorded mean, you know, uh, meaning when people say that winning is about leaving rest behind, achieving something. 
com becoming competitive. Competition may not be necessarily negative in its connotation, right? Competition can be healthy also, but are the students knowing the difference between a healthy competition and an unhealthy competition? Is it only about winning? Is it about means or is it about ends or is it about means to an end? So are these debates, these dialogues happening in the classroom? So those are also important things that can have a lot of implication if we look at PERMA, right? So we ultimately talking about satisfaction. You grow more when you grow with everybody. I mean, there, there are no two doubts about it. So those are the things that are important. Moving on. What is it that this PERMA is emphasizing, right? So we're talking about the social emotional learning. We are not only understand our understanding ourselves, we are also understanding others around us, right? So it will ensure emotional learning in the sense that there will be increased positive emotions and positive emotions are always good because they make you feel healthy, mentally healthy. They give you that kind of mental support that you need. Increased engagement. If you are more engaged, you get less into unwanted activities, right? As we say that um, an empty mind is a devil's workshop, so we will not be empty. We will not be empty minded. We will not be empty in our. Day to day lives. Uh, I can see some hands raising. Uh, would do I take the questions right now? Or it would be better to take them towards the end. Nida, uh, I Nida's hand up. It would be good, ma'am, if we take the answers at the end. That sure, would be great. Sure. So I will request all of you to Thank please you. Uh, remember and uh, your questions and um, or comments or suggestions or whatever, and um, we will take them towards the end. Thank you. Right. So we yeah. So again, engagement. We're talking about relations. We're talking about service. Are we contributing? And we're talking about accomplishments, right? All right, uh, I, I'm sorry. I think I should not go to the other PPT. It's better I move here, right? So, you know, it teaches us the way to manage stress. We can handle stress. We can overcome stress. And we can actually yield more increased academic achievement because we can increase greater heights like this. And of course, I mean, if you are high on well-being, if your stress levels are controlled, if there is no anxiety, you will always perform better. You will be more creative. Your decision making will be more effective, right? OK, so we've already touched base with almost everything when we talk about benefits, but let's have a very quick recap. We are talking about better academic performance. We are talking about improved attitudes because our approach becomes positive, solution focused, growth mindset. We start looking at things from a very different lens than we used to look at them earlier, right? We have a deeper commitment to what we are doing because we are involved. We feel responsible there and we also devote a lot of time, right? We have more positive behavior. We gather better attendance from our students, which of course is a very big challenge, and especially with this online setup, it is a very big challenge for all of us. There are fewer negative behaviors like, you know, disrupting the classroom, non-compliance, non-attendance. So um, these kind of things, aggressions, where will be the space of reactions in this kind of a setup? There will be none. Right? There will be less emotional distress. Nobody would feel bad. Nobody would feel guilty. So when you play from your strengths, you're definitely going to make a difference. All right. I mean, we I mean, this is I I think it's being recorded, so you will anyways have an access to this uh, lecture in the PPT, but I'm not going to make you do this exercise, but just imagine. I mean, it's very interesting. Which are the teachers whom we remember? Which are the memories we are so fond of when we go back to our school and college? We remember those teachers who touched our lives, who inspired us in a way. We never remember those teachers who taught us shortcuts or who told us that, you know, OK, I'm giving you marks. We are happy with those teachers, but we may not necessarily remember them. But what is the memory that flashes back? 
who was the teacher that touched you? So think about those things. Make your students also do those those kind of activities. OK, now if you talk about one of the earliest models in the field of positive psychology, this is a very interesting model and uh, this is the model of positive education, right? So flourishing is at the center and we are talking about playing from our strengths and why, why do we call them character strengths is because we are talking about virtues like human humanity, wisdom, right? Values. We're talking about those kind of things. So what are those life, universal life values that we are talking about? Honesty, integrity, we are talking about them. So you learn, you live them, and then you teach. You embed them into your course curriculums. Again, you learn, you live them, right? And the cycle goes on and on and on. And it is all about these five things. It is about positive emotions. It is about positive health because your students will be very mentally healthy people, right? It is about positive engagements, accomplishments, and they are all linked together. So this is a cycle. It goes on and this is a virtuous cycle. It is not a vicious cycle, right? So this is a good model of positive education. Then um, Martin Seligman and his colleagues, they have extensively worked upon these VIA characters, character strengths, right? And what is this VIA? VIA stands for values in action. So in early 2000s, they did this study and there were some 55 distinguished scientists from different parts of the world who joined together to accomplish this study and they identified 24 such strengths into divided into six categories. Right, so um, sorry, I am going back to the bigger presentation that I have more on my screen. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, so they talk about these values. So they are, you know, they they have these. They've bucketed into six categories, and these six are divided four. So they they have six for the twenty four character strengths that they call right. And it is also very interesting that it's not about just knowing on which are you good at it is there are also constellations and when we mean uh, what do we mean by constellations that means if i am authentic and at the same time my work ethic is very high these two are coming together to say something to me right and if i have weaknesses i also know about them so i know that i'm a, i'm very good at something and if I play from my strengths, I'm definitely going to achieve much more than I play from what I am not good at. I will set myself up for failures, right? So that is why understanding this knowledge of these constellations of these strengths is very interesting. And there's a lot of scope for research to be done here because very less research has been done on constellations. A lot of research has been done on VIA and character strengths, but less on these constellations. And these are your unique. Why do we call them signature strengths or character strengths? These are very unique to you. Right? And whatever people may say, but if you're good at something, that's your USP. You are good at it. You should try to achieve from that angle and you will go a long way. Right, so it is about your skills, talents, interest, resources, those special gifts that you have, right? Who are you at the core? So if I say who is Gabriel or who is Menka, what then it is not about that you are an assistant professor or an associate professor or a professor. It is about who are you at the core as a person? Who are you? Do you know you? Right? So those are the things that we deal with when we talk about these character strengths, and that is very important also. So I'm sure the Internet is full of these, um, you know, you can go Google, you can just check them out. But here is a look of it, and this is a study by Peterson and Seligman uh, in 2004. So these are your six bucketed categories, and what all do you have in these? So courage, humanity, transcendence, temperance, uh, justice, and 
wisdom and knowledge, right? And then how do you further categorize? So for example, courage is having bravery, persistence, integrity, and vitality, right? So th those are the kind of constellations that are there in this via character strength. So you can have a look at it if you're more interested. In the interest of time, we will just move on. And uh, also there are some examples of, you know, what, what can we do with this character education practices? Why, why do we need to educate our students using these characters? So why is it that there's so much corruption today? Why is it that there's so much crime today? Why is it that educated people are getting involved into the most heinous kinds of crimes against humanity? Somewhere we are lacking. I mean, we talk about moral education, we talk about value education, but somewhere we are lacking. We are lagging behind in terms of actually giving the best to our next generation. Right? And that is why it is important that this concept is embedded into our curriculum itself. We do have courses around these concepts. We teach students right from, you know, from kindergarten to their end of higher education or to the topmost education, which is a maybe a doctoral degree or a postdoctoral degree, right? We need to keep on having them as part of our curriculum. That is what I'm advocating for. So uh, they develop that kind of language, you know? They're not only appreciative of what good are they at, they also start looking at what others are good at. And they stop judging their counterparts because they understand that if I have certain limitations, so does my counterpart. So does my student, uh, so does my friend, right? So does my classmate. So that is the language and the lens that we need to provide our students with. They are able to recognize and think about strengths in others. So it's not that I'm only the best one. I'm awesome. It's not full of me. It's about we, right? So you can design um, interventions. I mean, they're easy to design. So here you have in front of you that, you know, you can assign a secret partner and then let them observe and let them write about that partner's strengths. This is how they start appreciating the good in others, right? So you teach them. See, if you want to teach diversity and inclusivity, right? It, I mean, the best way to do it, have those kind of days. I, as a person who's fortunate enough to see, will never be able to appreciate the life of a blind person unless I live it. So in many schools, you know, they have this um, ritual where there will be one day, which is, I'll say, for example, a blind day. You have to, throughout the day in the school, you have to live like a blind person. And that is when children start appreciating that life, how good life has been for them and how difficult it is sometimes for other people. So instead of mocking, that empathy is developed. They start helping their own fellow mates, right? So those kind of things are important to be taught. I mean, we always think, I mean, they're all there in me. Why do I need to think about them? Why do I need to talk about them? But somewhere in our daily lives, in our fast lives, we're forgetting all this. So it's important for us to keep reminding ourselves that these softer things are what we live for. They are what provides meaning to life. And that's the right way of living. All right. So what next can you do? Recognizing and thinking about one's own strengths also. So you need to do a maybe a 360, take some assessment, and you need to receive feedback, right? So what do you think? Is it the same as what others think about you? Do a tally. So those kind of exercises can also help. You can... Practice and apply strengths, right? So you can identify specific ways. You can identify areas in which these strengths can be applied to, right? All right. Moving on, identifying, celebrating, cultivating group strengths. Now, this is something which is very important because it's not just about me and mine. It is about ours. Right. So how do we inculcate that culture of appreciating strengths in a group? So it's about my class. It's not about just me. It's about all my classmates. 
not just me. So students and teachers should conduct this kind of group strengths audit, right? So you sit down, you identify various ways of if I take your class as an example, what are the signature strengths of your class? So how is BBA second year different from BBA first year? What can BBA second year do very well, which BBA first year cannot, right? So those kind of things. So um, these school based interventions, of course, the entire initial research was done at um, at the uh, school levels, but um, it also has a lot of application and there are some studies which have also been done at higher in educational institution levels. And I think we need to do a lot of research in this area to come up with more meaningful findings which are applicable to the AGIs per se. All right, so you know you uh, of course well being is one of the most important both intervention and outcome for these kind of uh, for the for positive education per se, right? So we have positive classroom behaviors. There's a lot of school achievement that we have if we are using character strengths based interventions, right? And students are more socially involved and they, their moods are more lifted, right? There is less stress, no burnout, develop skills for learning and achievement. They And if they are losing out on something, they know how to create, they learn how to create. And that is the beauty of this. So it buffers against many management related uh, problems, right? They help you to manage problems, they help you to create resources if there is absence of resources, right? You can get into better solution finding. So those are the, again, benefits of having these kind of interventions used. Now in next we talk about growth mindset very quickly. So we've been using this term, what is fixed mindset and what is growth mindset. Uh, the most important work in this area was done by Carol Dwick and colleagues. And um, they, they've basically uh, studied student attitudes about failures, right? And they've understood whether, you know, whether you work with a fixed mindset, you know, So that's like a fixed mindset. But when you say, let me learn from it. That is a positive. That's a more growth mindset. You recognize, you accept, and you get into action. Right. So, um, yeah, we've talked about that where, you know, you believe your attitudes at, uh, attributes such as talent, intelligence are all fixed. You cannot do anything about them. And but in a growth mindset, you actually embrace those challenges. You set more challenging goals for yourselves, right? You persevere with challenges. So you have to use that positive language. See, when you talk, when you tell somebody, you know, these are your strengths and these are your weaknesses. Now, uh, the moment I hear it's a weakness, I feel I can't do anything about it unless that's the truth. We, we are not talking about positive, um, you know, toxic positivity here. We are not saying that just talk positive. Where even if the person is dumb, tell you're a bright person. No, we're not saying that. We are talking about being realistic, right? But what we are trying to say is that the moment I tell you, you know, these are your developmental areas, somebody gets motivated. The language itself makes all the difference. You shouldn't have done that. How about doing this? See the change in the tone and the language, and that can work wonders with these young minds. So uh, it's important that feedback is given very often and taken very often and the right way. Feedback is not about talking anything that you want to. Feedback is not about reacting. Feedback is always constructive, right? So. It helps you to grow. So attribute your success or failure to your level of effort, right? Don't start blame gaming. So this is what we need to teach ourselves and what we need to teach our students, right? So we need to work hard. We need to seek. Uh, we need to see setbacks as more motivating and informative. I mean, look at them as opportunities. Failures are grounds for success. Failures are opportunities for success, right? Finding a process that will bring you success and sticking by in, learning from feedback and constructive criticism. 
So these are these are all things which are indicative of having a growth mindset. You're more interested in learning and growing, right? And so these are the kind of questions you should ask your students. What did you learn from your mistakes? Right? How can you challenge yourself to become more effective? What are you hoping to learn by completing this task? So these are the kind, this is the language, these are the kind of questions that will help students also develop a growth mindset. Right? And if you want to teach growth mindset, you can get involved in these four practices. Embrace growth mindset for yourself first. See, charity begins at home. You have to start with yourself only. Right? You have to be the role model. Provide an introduction to growth mindset with analogies. Analogies work very well. Metaphors, stories, anecdotes, they all work very well with students. Emphasize the learning process. And they should know what is it that they are heading towards. Why are they going for it? How is it different from a fixed mindset? And introduce growth mindset with examples. Keep some, you know, incentives, keep some schemes. You get a star badge. This is what you've done. This is how you've grown over the years. So those kind of strategies can help, right? And last, we talk about restorative practices. So restorative practices are also very important because they proactively build these healthy relationships and a sense of community, most importantly. So it's not just, you know, focus on one person. The focus is on many, right? All right. And so what is it that is important when we talk about restorative practices? We are addressing and discussing the needs of the school community. So, you know, make students sit together, talk to them like your children at home, even your kids, your own, your parents to kids, right? Talk to them, share problems with them, discuss, have a dialogue, let them get involved. This is how you build accountability and responsibility into them. And they also feel accountable to contribute, right? To manage, to deal with the situation, to do their best. Like I remember explicitly when we were very small, uh, we were kids. And uh, once I asked my father that, and, and you know, my, I asked both my parents, father and mother, and I told them, so you both work and what do we do? Aap log ghar chalate ho, hum kya kare, batao. And they gave a very beautiful answer. I remember today. They said, Sabka kaam divided hai. Hamara kaam agar hai kaam karna, job karna, ghar chalana, aapka abhi kaam hai padhai karna. To agar aap achha padhai karoge, then that's how you're contributing towards the home. Right? Taking care of the home needs. And that was a response which remained with me forever. And that's what I'm sharing with you today on this platform. So, har ka kaam hona chahiye. So, we should not say, nahi, nahi, tum aram karo. Aap agar unne aram karna aaj sikha rahe ho, to wo kal bhi aram hi karenge. Phir bura mat manna. That, and same applies to our students. It's okay, bachche hain. Bachche hain, magar unhe responsible bhi banna hai. Right? Lekin positive tarikhe se. Punishment deke, unko penalize karke, it, you can't do that to your own students. So you need to help them grow. You need to help them see the right side of things. Build perspectives, right? That is what a teacher is for. So build these healthy relationships between educators and students. Likewise, they'll get connected with you. Reduce, prevent, and improve harmful behavior, right? Repair harm and restore positive relationships. Resolve conflict. Now link it back to your PERMA model. Positive engagement, positive relationships, positive accomplishments, adding meaning, everything is being covered here, right? So what are the benefits of then finally this positive education? We are promoting human development through this. And we are actually creating better citizens for tomorrow. We are teaching our students to be happy. If you're not happy with yourself, you cannot make others happy, right? So if you're teaching your students to be happy, high on well-being, you're creating a beautiful world for tomorrow. There will be very less depression. I mean, imagine how much depression has set in. India used to boast of 
not having depression numbers and today India is so high on depression index, right? And, and that is because of the changing society, the chaos that we are in, facilitating academic performance and boosting resilience. On that note, I thank you very much for your patience and being a good audience. We can open it up for discussion. Um, Pravneet ma'am, are you there? Uh, yes ma'am, yes, I am there. Oh, okay ma'am. Yes. Uh, thank you so much ma'am. Thank you so much for the wonderful uh, presentation that was there. Uh, I asked the participants in case there are any questions. I guess a very well explained uh, session, ma'am. Uh, I had lots of hands in between, but unfortunately, I couldn't take it at that point in time. So I would love to have at least <clears throat> we have some eight minutes on us. So if anybody mm -hmm. would like to ask something, I would love to address that. I think we have two hands raised. Mr. Parveen Kumar and Swamita Sarkar. Uh, Swamita ma'am, you can ask questions. Yes. I have given you the rights mm -hmm. to speak ma'am. Okay, uh, good afternoon ma'am. Very good afternoon. Uh, ma'am, uh, thank you so much for this nice session. My question too is that, uh, generally, I I I am working in a residential school, ma'am, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it's a Navodaya Vidyalaya, Jawahar Navodaya Vidyalaya under Central Government uh, Government of India, Ministry of Education. So I I am a housemaster also, and the way you have dealt that we are uh, guiding the students 24 hours. So sometimes what happens there is a clash between whatever we teach them and whatever they get the feedback from the parents and the students community. So in such a case, what we are supposed to do to guide the students to follow the right path? As you told one very nice thing, delayed gratification. I think nowadays the generation has become very impatient and uh, we see so much of traffic in the road that itself shows that people have lost their patience. So can you guide us ma'am that how can we teach the students to have more patience and to, have a, to make them understand um, what is the meaning of delayed gratification? Thank you ma'am. Sure. So um, if you want to, you know, conduct a workshop or show a video, there's a wonderful video on YouTube um, because unfortunately we didn't have that kind of time. I couldn't show it to you, but it's on. Um, so you can type marshmallow experiment and uh, you will get this experiment. You can show this video to students, right? And uh, that's a fun way of starting the dialogue. But what you need to also tell them, you, you make come up with, uh, I mean, search the internets full of video clips. Try to figure out those where you see that how a person who is getting into instant gratification is actually having implications, lifelong implications uh, because of the wrong things that they do. Or maybe a simpler way could be gather these group of students, you know, and design some assignment or intervention. Let them go out, do it and then come when they come back, talk to them, let help them reflect upon what happened and how did they distinguish between this instant and delayed gratification. Other thing which you're talking about, I completely agree with you that we may teach a lot of things, but then the, the moment they're back at home, that's a different environment, right? So what do we do? So I think we could have some days when you could have a dialogue with the parents and maybe you know you could so of course these things are easier said than done these things sound as if you know it's it's an it's a one day intervention kind of thing no it doesn't happen that way you will really have to sit with experts design a whole study around it 
and then start conducting. But what I'm trying to say is that bit by bit the ocean grows, right? So these are small little contributions, but if you start thinking on those lines, it will eventually happen. There is no very simple two plus two is equal to four answer that I can give you right now. But uh, but but yeah, it's a, it's a process and we have to start somewhere. That's my only uh, response that I would give to your question, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. I'll definitely take this back and this uh, videos that I'll definitely search. Thank you so much, ma'am. Oh, thank you so much. Ma'am, if you allow, uh, can we take one more question? Please do. Okay, ma'am. I think uh, Ms. Preeti Rathi and Parveen Kumar, I could see their hands up. Preeti Rathi, ma'am, I have given you the rights to uh, unmute yourself. Ma'am, please do ask the question. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. This is Preeti Rathi from St. Joseph's Degree and PG College. Uh, Hyderabad. Uh, I am teaching since uh, last 25 years. Okay, as you said that we have to uh, try to understand what the student's conceptual and the, the how, how he tries to uh, get us. But when it comes to my uh, workplace and home place, how jovial, how lovely I am at my teaching place, sometimes it happens that when I come home, it is just the opposite. My students say that, my children say that, Mama, you are a very good teacher. But when it comes to my personal life, they say, Mama, you are ignoring us. So how can I uh, do a balance between my children and my students, ma'am? So, ma'am, first, first of all, ma'am, yeah, uh, yeah, your question. session was uh, very interesting, ma'am, though. Though I'm COVID positive right now, but I you, you I made it and you made me hear all your conversations. This is a simple thing which I want to clarify between my children and my students. Man. Because for me, my students are also important and for me, my children are also very important. So, and one more question is, ma'am, uh, as to a child who is more patient, as you said in that marshmallow video, you said that, ma'am, uh, he tends to be, I couldn't get it very clear, ma'am. Can you once again explain these two things, ma'am, to me? Sure, sure. First of all, thank you so much for attending when you're not well. And I <laughs> wish you a very speedy recovery. I thank hope you. that you get well very soon. And thank you. Uh, so, yeah, and I appreciate your uh, participation. Uh, uh, so, okay, so the first question first. Um, about, see, we all teachers have that problem, you know, and we, we cannot be mothers to just our kids. I mean, if you are a passionate teacher, we are mothers to our students as well. So I think the important thing is that um, we need to have that balance within ourselves first. And we need to really apply all these concepts upon us first, because if that happens, I am sure that there will be less difference between the school kids and our own kids and the behavior that we have, which manifests towards both of them, right? The another thing is what happens is that after all, when we are looking outwards, we are talking to other people. It is more about interactions as in, you know, it's somewhere your accountability stops. I mean, you are accountable in a certain way, but somewhere that is a little less when it comes to being a parent. And with your kids, you feel so responsible that you get agitated at times, you get a little annoyed with them at times because there's a lot of expectations, right? You do expect from your students, but you expect a lot from your own kids. And I think that is what has to stop because it is their journeys. You are only responsible to nurture them, to guide them and to mentor them and to protect them. You are not responsible for leading their lives. 
So somewhere you have to let it go. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but that is the response. Thank you, ma'am. And another question, ma'am, that uh, yeah, Marshall. So yeah, so what happens is, see, I mean, we are all, all of us as humans, you know, we have this tendency. The moment you see something you want, you're tempted and you want to go for it. But we we don't stop to think. We we act on our impulse. We don't stop to think whether you know what do we really. So, for example, I'll give you an example. If we look at a flower, it's a lovely flower and feel like plucking it up. Now, do we want this flower or do we like this flower? There is a difference between liking and wanting. Right? So many a times if you plug that flower for that one minute, you will feel very good. Then it, either it will be lying on your desk or maybe it will go into the dustbin. But the life of that flower is gone. But if you love that flower, you will you will let it be where it is. You will water it. You will nourish it. Right. Mm -hmm. So can you hold your instincts for a better decision? That is what we mean by this whole concept of instant gratification or delayed gratification. So people who can hold their instincts for a better judgment, those are the people who become more responsible and accountable in future. And people who want to just go by their instincts and wants, they are more likely to be prone to becoming or getting engaged into some kind of direct indirect criminal behaviors. If Thank you so works. much, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, I guess we have one more question. If you allow, we can have one more question. Sure, I can allow, but I think you have a next session. So we I'm can, that if you can. Uh, yes, we it. do have, ma'am. Yeah. So. OK, let's take this last one. Last one, ma'am, yes. Yeah. I'm just allowing the person. Yes, uh, we have. Uh, Ms. Priyanka Maheshwari, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, you can please ask a question. Uh, Priyanka, ma'am, can you hear us? Pradneet, ma'am, I think she's not there. So let's start. Yes, I guess uh, we have. Uh, ma'am is also waiting. She has uh, sent sure. me a message. Sure, ma'am, sure. But uh, let me just uh, thank ma'am for this wonderful uh, insights that she has given on the topic of role and importance of positive education. And ma'am, I must say that your excellent examples of the concept uh, will help us understand the meaning of the positive education better today. The central idea which you shared in the very beginning that uh, you do not teach your children values, but rather teach them to value values is something that uh, I guess I am personally I'm going to imbibe. So as you said, I agree that it's a long uh, road ahead, but it's a process and we need to uh, start somewhere. So thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you uh, for sharing your valuable time with us today. Thank you so much for your presence, ma'am. Thank you so much. And for that quote, let me say it is somebody else's, not mine, but I so <laughs> love it that I would always want to quote it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Bye-bye. All the best to everybody. Thank you. So uh, moving ahead with our uh, session, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker for the second afternoon uh, session, uh, Dr. Maha Shweta. Uh, Mahashweta Saha. Dr. Mahashweta Saha has completed her PhD from the prestigious IIT Kharagpur and is presently working as an assistant professor at the Department of uh, Business Management, Tripura University. Uh, she has rich experience spanning across consulting with PricewaterCoopers, uh, product development with Whirlpool, and research and academics for the last 18 years. She has presented her papers in several uh, reputed international conferences, Pan IAM, Pan IIT, and other repu reputed conferences. Uh, she is the proud author and editor of the book titled uh, Purvut Tararan, A Rise of the Northeast, Paradigms of Development in the VUCA World. Her teaching interest involves consumer behavior, production and questions management, and research methodology for postgraduate and undergraduate level. 
she has delivered many lectures at national as well as um, uh, international level so uh, do we have uh, ma'am with us at the moment so we'll just wait uh, for uh, ma'am for a few minutes and i'm sure uh, like this wonderful session we had in the uh, the first session that we had we'll have an amazing second session as well so i request patience from all the participants for another 5 minutes and we'll be resuming the session again ma'am yes uh, yes now it is fine yes 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 ma'am ma'am please you are so, most welcome ma'am to the session yeah thank you so much is my voice audible yes ma'am okay okay great so earlier also actually i joined but uh, i was unable to share and you know talk so i just informed menka so good afternoon everyone and i was hearing the last session it was going on so well and uh, so uh, so can i begin shall i begin the session okay okay so i will just uh, share the ppt and then uh, uh, so participants uh, i welcome you in this fdp and uh, earlier session was more on i think the qualitative side this is a bit quantitative side and i guess you all have had your lunch and do not sleep off because there is some quantitative session which i am going to share with you all in between uh, you can ask me questions or maybe we can take up questions towards the end if if my voice is not audible or you face anything then you please raise your hand so with this uh, let us start the ppt let me share it and uh, yeah so so are you able, are you able to see the ppt yeah uh, yes ma'am it is visible okay okay so uh, today we are going to talk about research based learning through spss and uh, spss we all know and we have used it for our research work for quantitative analysis but uh, this one will my uh, ppt will help you to know the basics of it and i am going to cover some of the tools and uh, with this we move ahead without wasting a time so basically what i am going to do is i am going to switch between spss platform and the ppt platform and i am going to show you uh, the spss also uh, so that whatever i am teaching you in the ppt that we can see in the spss so we are going to see different views of the spss platform then we will touch base upon the descriptive statistics and followed by reliability analysis followed by the regression so uh, my slide is moving and i am audible to all of you uh ma'am be able to see the first slide that is there first slide and you are not able to see the second slide table of contents no ma'am right now it is not now it is there yes ma'am it's moving. okay so i will not go for full screen otherwise i think it's a problem i will go for um this screen only okay so now we go to the third slide and uh, so basically for this i will take you to the spss so there are in spss if you see the window the first there are two pages one is data view and one is variable view so data view has all the input and entries where you will input all the um uh, values and in that you will have certain cells 
cells if you could recollect uh, that there are certain cells so basically there are rows uh, which are cases and there are columns which are variable so what happens what we do is first we go to the variable view and in that variable view we enter all the details of the variables which we want in the data view so once i show you the spss screen you will understand that uh, how do we enter an in variable view we have to uh, write the variable name then we have to select the data type then is it a string or a quantity that we have to enter and then we will go for descriptive variable then there is a value label then there is a column width measurement level all this you will see in a better you will understand better when i show you the spss so one is your variable view where where you will enter all the variable related data and all the variables will be listed in the data view once you enter the variable details now now in this uh, data view in the data view uh, your rows are the cases now what are actually this cases each row will receive will present an observation for example it will be one individuals one individual question answer okay columns are variables okay columns are your columns are variable where one variable under one variable what all question the different respondents has answered that will be there in the column so now in the excel you can do some operations like some average range using the cell value but in spss we cannot do like that okay so those cells once data is entered that cannot be changed now in the variable view you this is very important you have to define the type of variable so now in the research methodology also you would have understood that what type of variables are there so this i will just refresh in spss there are three types of variables first is nominal then there is ordinal and there is a scale so when we use likert type of data like five point scale seven point scale then we will use scale acha nominal is something like uh, nominal is basically a name of a person which name of a person like teams name of the football players name of the cricket players so we cannot do any quantitative operation using the nominal data but they represent some category but they don't have any ranking like we cannot say a is better than b or a is greater than b a and b are the name of the uh, variable so now that is nominal category of the variable ordinal is something like you know which is higher which is lower okay you have different categories of it but you don't know how much they are lesser or Uh, greater so that is your ordinal and scale is something we know that who is less who is more and by what degree or by what unit or by what amount they are less or more that is the scale in ideal condition we generally use scale data so we will select the scale okay so now with this i will share the sps screen with you okay that screen i will share and then i will give you the demonstration of the uh, theoretical thing what i have told so i will stop sharing and again i will share the spss file with you all so are you all able to see the spss file now yes ma'am okay so now you see there are two views data 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 view and the variable view so in the variable view there are different type of variable like m1 m2 m3 m4 m01 like this so these are type is here you can select it's a numeric or a string okay so it's a numeric one and then you can give up to what place of decimal it is there okay and then after that you can define those what is m1 here i have not defined you can click and write m1 is say monetary gain okay so whatever the name of the variable you can mention here okay 
so after that you will go to the measure which i told you scale ordinal nominal so these are actually uh, scale data using likert scale i have taken and other things remain same so once i enter m1 there in the data view m1 will come on the top so i told you this is a row row is respondent 1 has given what a answer question m3 question m4 so this is respondent 1 and this is the row and this is the column column is for m1 question or the item we can say what all values all the respondents have given so there are lot of values i have collected this uh, this is a big one nearly 400 450 data is there 416 number of data is there so this is a likert scale and m1 m2 m3 so you understood row and column column is basically your uh, answer for the m1 question and row is the what all question answer uh, is given by first respondent and then second respondent so like this and this is the cell so this is this is basically about data view and the variable view so if you enter for example if you enter l67 okay so it will by enter it will take some uh, default value so you can numeric to string you can change then you can change this to scale and then you can change the decimal to 1 or something so now if you go to the data view you can find out ls7 automatically coming here but this column is empty because we do not have any data but it has already taken ls7 so once you enter something automatically some values will be taken and it will be shown as a heading over here so that is the connection between data view and variable ideally when you open a spss file you should first go to variable view enter and then you can export data from excel or you can directly copy paste also that's not an issue but here you have to select up to one place of decimal up to two place of decimal like that so with this i will again go to as uh, your uh, ppt and in the ppt i will share with you and then again we will go to the spss slide so this this will first share the theory and then we will go to the demo so um, let me go to the ppt again so in this ppt we have seen the variable view now descriptive statistics so now for any data you have to find the uh, mean median mode standard deviation kurtosis range is the difference between the highest value and the lowest value then mean is a common uh, idea of how the data looks like then what is the standard deviation of this data then what is the kurtosis of this data so all these are basics which in descriptive statistics we will understand so th for this you should know the basic statistics to understand spss remember spss is just a tool but you need to strengthen your statistical knowledge so that it can help you in your uh, basic quantitative analysis so descriptive statistics we will see now before that we will go to a certain tool which is very very important which is known as factor analysis so many of you have known what is factor analysis and it is mostly used in survey kind of a research survey method we use factor analysis so in what condition we use and why we use and how do we use what are the types of factor analysis we will see and do it in spss so basically in sp in any survey method in quantitative survey method you have certain observed variable and latent variable so observed variable are something which you actually collect from the field and using observed variable you will find the latent variable which are so basically different observed variable will make one latent variable for example i would like to measure the customer satisfaction so customer satisfaction is a latent variable and customer satisfaction scale is given by someone which will have 5 to 7 items or questions or observed well variables using those five question we will measure that so we will have to first find out the right scale like e service quality e serve quel scale is given by parshuraman 
and lot of, lot of scale. There is a right scale which has to be fitted, which we will adapt. We will not develop our own scale because developing own scale is a big thing. So basically what we do is we will go for adapting the scale for different construct which we will use in our model and then using those scale uh, we will try to gather the data. Now customer satisfaction is a unobserved or a latent variable that we will measure using the observed variable or the question. So now what is factor analysis? First we have to understand. OK, so factor analysis, there are two types. One is exploratory factor analysis and second one is confirmatory factor analysis. So exploratory factor analysis is also known as EFA. And confirmatory factor analysis is also known as CFA. So exploratory factor analysis EFA we do in SPSS and confirmatory factor analysis we do in AMOS. So right now today we will talk about EFA only. Then what is this EFA? You see EFA will give us the link between observed variable and latent variable. So basically in many cases we do not have standard construct name. We just go for collecting the data where we don't know what could be the name of the latent variable. So using observed variable which can be 20, 30, 40 items. We do not have any scientific data. So we have 20 observed variable or the items or the question. We will do an EFA and we will see how many latent variable we will get. So basically one latent variable can have five observed items or six observed item. So this will be shown in EFA where we will divide them into five or six, five or six latent variable. So in those latent variable, your observed variable will fall and it will show us a linkage. So basically factor analytic approach we use in those kind of studies where we do not have any prior knowledge about what items will be there in say for example customer satisfaction, what item could be there in customer inspiration. So different type of new constructs are there and we have designed our own questionnaire. That is one case where we use EFA. The second case is we would like to confirm whether all these items or all these observed variable will fall in those latent variable or not. OK, so. We have sometimes some of the items are deleted, then we reduce the number of items also and we see what is the linkage between your observed variable and the latent variable. So observed variable is actually what we collect from the field. We ask the respondent those question. Using that we define our latent variable. OK, one latent variable can have many observed variable or the items. We can call it items also the observed variable. It can have so basically it will show us a table. In that table we will understand how many items or how many variable it will be. I'll show you in SPSS how do we actually do it. OK, for example, they have given example also. A researcher develops a new instrument designed to measure five facets of physical self concept like health, sport competence, physical appearance, coordination, body strength. These are the five latent variable. Now when we make the questionnaire using this five latent construct, then we have to do an EFA to determine that how closely the latent variable are connected with the observed variable. OK, these relations are represented by factor loading. So this loading will help us to know that what items are falling on the different factors or the unobserved variable. So for example, the items which are designed to measure health, health is a latent variable. 
they will exhibit high loadings on that factor and low loadings on other factor so we can confirm that these items make the health sports competence item will load strongly on the sport competence uh, variable so this will not be clear until and unless i show you so we will go to the spss and we will see before that i would like to also show you the reliability and these two things we will do in spss so basically we do another analysis known as reliability analysis so reliability analysis was given is given by cronbeck alpha so all the constructs or all the latent variable should have more than 0.7 of the reliability so that it can be accepted as satisfactory so factor wise reliability or unobserved variable wise reliability we will find out and we will see whether those are more than 0.7 or not okay so these two we will see in spss and uh, i will just share with you right now the again spss file so let us go to the spss file so here you can see the spss file where you have these are observed variable okay observed variable these are the observed variable so m1 m2 m3 m4 m5 m is one unobserved variable or latent variable mo is another one e1 is another one then you have rt m1 is another one a1 is another one like this you have lot of items which according to the literature review we think that they fall in this category but when we actually do the factor analysis we will confirm it whether it is possible or not so now we go to analyze very carefully please listen to me analyze and then we go to dimension reduction in that dimension reduction we will go to the factor we go to the factor and we take up all the constructs or we take up a part of it say learn ls is learner satisfaction that is the dependent variable will not take that we will take the other things okay we take the other things so we go and take the other things okay we select like this and then till ss5 we can take so this way we will select or we can select together also but right now i'll select individually because i am going to delete some of the item which are not important so we select up to ts5 and then we take it here we can select here and then we go to descriptives and here we go for kmo and barlett's test this is important for understanding your sample adequacy or fine or not then we go to continue then we go to extraction we go for scree plot this is important and then principal component analysis this is a standard one and then if they are asking you want a fixed number of factors we will not give because it will give a biased opinion then we go to rotation we can go for none or we can go for very much only continue and then score uh, we can we need not mention anything and then an option they will give suppress small coefficient so we will we generally don't consider factor loading lesser than 0.3 so we give 0.3 some people give 0.5 also we continue and we will go for okay and then we can see we will see the answer coming in the output window it is coming so we see you see kmo test sample adequacy is 0.916 so basically it should be closer to 1 so sample is quite adequate then communalities we don't have to look into it here we can see this one where it is 66% variance is defined by how many factors 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 factor 
eight factors so it is processing it is coming we have to wait for some time so we have to see the rotated component matrix uh, rotated component matrix is this one so you see you can just copy this and take it to excel also but right now i will show you like this in rotated component matrix you see under component 5 m1 m2 m3 m4 m5 is coming okay so that means it is under m1 only all the m5 but here there are two loadings cross loading is happening this m3 is loading on component 4 also but the amount is less so we can ignore the more amount out of one is here so that is fine we can delete this then we go to m m01 mo2 mo3 mo4 mo5 mo6 this six are loading under seventh one there is a bit of cross loading but that can be deleted then we go to e1 e2 a3 here there is some problem in the data because e1 e2 e3 e4 are loading on one factor and e5 e6 e7 is loading on another factor so that shows data has some problem then rtm1 is okay then here a1 a2 a3 is again segregated some problem in this data then at at2 again it is segregated here and there ts1 is again fine so like this we will understand that what is the linkage of this sometimes we delete one factor and then again we run who which has the lowest and then we try to remove the cross loading like a1 this you see a1 complete factor is going here and there a1 is one place a4 is a4 is one place then it is a3 is fine then again you have something like uh, a6 is okay okay others are negative in nature and lesser in nature so like that we know that which all cross loading we can reduce the items also these are known as items we can reduce them which are negative in nature we can again run and see so like this it is important to know tricks that is very very important now we go to again our efa file and then in this efa file we will check the reliability which i told you reliability okay so reliability is another important thing which will help us to understand that whether our questionnaire is reliable or not so we have to do it factor wise so factor wise doing it we take the scale and we go for reliability analysis and then first we do for m1 m2 m so m1 m2 m3 m4 m5 we do it and then in statistics we can give item scale scale if item deleted if we want we can go for correlation also it is not required much then we item scale and scale item deleted is important then we go for continue so it will give us for m1 m so we go for this you see m is 0.816 we it has to be more than 0.7 so 0.816 is obviously more than 0.7 so that's a good thing so scale if item deleted is important because it will help us to understand that if that item is deleted then what is the remaining so if m1 is deleted still it is 0.784 if m2 is deleted still it is 0.787 like this so <clears throat> so this is a good one similarly yeah similarly um there are other khali ho gaya khush ro so there are other also yes yeah is there are, are there any questions or shall we move ahead uh, no continue you can continue ma'am okay so uh, basically um this way we have to find out the uh, reliability of, of the instrument we have to go one by one and uh, like we have found out for m1 then similarly we have to go for mo mo2 m5 then e1 like that and we will see every construct or every latent variable has the reliability more than or less than what a 0.7 or not so now we will again go to our spss we will leave the spss we'll go to ppt and we will cover the regression part of it and then we will see once again a bit regression so ppt and uh, we will see what is regression we all know what is regression but then regression is more to understand so again i am in ppt and uh, so basically 
So in regression, I will cover a bit of using SPSS only. So when we do the regression, regression is basically a relationship between independent variable and the dependent variable. So there is a multiple regression and there is a simple linear regression also where you have one independent variable and one dependent variable, but ideally it does not. Variable and one dependent variable. So when we run the regression, we get a table like this in that we have R and R square and adjusted R square. So what is R? What is R square and what is adjusted R square? R is basically coefficient of correlation. It shows it, the more it is closer to one, then it shows that it is a good level of uh, good uh, indicator. This independent variable is definitely influencing the dependent variable. So the more and R square is coefficient of determination. It will show you the strength of the relationship. OK, how much proportion of the variation is accounted by the regression model? So R is R square is coefficient of determination, which is known as correlation and R is the coefficient of correlation. Uh, so basically R square is coefficient of determination and R is coefficient of correlation. When we do the R square, we get the coefficient of determination. Now we should see R square or adjusted R square. That is another question which I will answer in the next slide. Now in the regression, how do we find the R square? So R square is equal to one minus one minus sum of square of the residuals divided by total sum of the square. R square, which is your coefficient of determination, it shows the strength of the correlation between the predictors and the dependent variable. OK, so it shows us how good the regression model is and it should be close to one. So R square is equal to one minus SSR by SST. Then what is SSR and what is SST? So for that we have to understand we have to see one diagram which is the most important diagram of this slide. So basically here you see uh, R. So basically these are this is one line which is the linear regression line which is defining your experience and salary. Experience is an independent variable and salary is a dependent variable. So basically we have drawn a line between these two. So based what is happening is the star ones are the actual observed values and we have drawn them to construct a line so that the distance is lesser between the observed variable and the predicted variable. OK, and so basically these are why I OK, and there is a line which is drawn, which is Y I cap. So SSR is Y I minus Y I cap. Y I cap is drawn on the line and Y I is basically your actual values. So we just move them down and we make them Y cap. And what is the difference we find out using SSR? So summation of the difference between the observed variable and the predicted variable is known as SSR. OK, you square it, but then what is SST? SST is YI, which is again observed variable minus Y average. So we take a average line, which is same, and then we subtract it and we square it. When we square it, it is positive. Then we sum it, we get SST. So this is the relationship between your, which I told you, 1 minus SSR by SST. So now if we go to 1 minus SSR by SST, we get the R square. Now with this we have to see whether we will see the R square or we will see the adjusted R square. So basically when we see R square there is a major flaw in this because when we keep on adding the new variables it will it is it, it, it this value will not increase or sometimes it will increase but then adjusted R square has the capability to decrease when we add less significant variable but General R square will only increase, which is giving us a wrong information, which will end result. So basically we should see the adjusted R square, which will sh actually show us whether the insignificant variables are reducing the R square or not. That's why we should see the adjusted R square. So this is about your regression. I gave you an idea and the basic concept behind the regression. Now uh, I'll go to the SPSS file to show you actual regression. How do we do it? So let us go to the SPSS file and complete the 
ओके सो इन दिस लर्न सेटिस्फैक्शन व्हिच इज अ डिपेंडेंट वेरिएबल एंड द आइटम्स यू रिमेंबर एमओएल एओएल आई हैव टेकन द एवरेज ऑफ ऑल द आइटम्स MOL1, MOL2, MOL3, MOL4, MOL5. Similarly for this, and I have put an average and made a new file. So we go to analyze, we go to analyze, we go to regression, and we go to linear regression. When we go to linear regression, learner satisfaction is the dependent variable, and independent variable we can choose memory, attention, motivation, attitude, emotion, all this perception, evaluation, or we can take and we can put it as an independent variable. so we go to statistics and we will see r squared change if you want model fit then uh, derbid watson also we can check then plots they are asking we can go for histogram and normal probability plot and then we save it unstandardized standardized residuals also unstandardized standardized okay and then we go to the options and uh, so again we see in statistics we will go for estimates model fit r square change descriptives also we can add it will show us the descriptive darwin watson okay and then we will go to the plot in the plot we can see histogram and normal probability it's up to you you want to see more then you have unstandardized and standardized here also we see we go to options and then we press the okay button okay then once we go for okay we get all this descriptive statistic the mean and the standard deviation of all the independent variable and then we get correlation this we do not see right now we go to the model summary you see the r value is very good 0.934 r square value is 0.872 but which one we should see adjusted r square of course there is a less difference between that okay so other things we don't see as of now we will mainly focus on r r square and adjusted r square now this table is very important one model summary is one important table and another table is anova table we see the model significance is less than 0.05 significance which is a significant model and then we see the coefficient what is the beat coefficient that means what is the relationship between the dependent variable and the independent variable so we see the beta beta standardized beta in the standardized beta we see memory role memory role is 0.3038 but it is not significant it is only significant when it is less than 0.05 or less than 0.01 0.01 is 99% and 0.05 is at 95 confidence interval so memory role is not significant attention is also not significant motivation is significant okay attitude is not significant it is at the border line emotion and then uh, ts so teacher student interaction is 0.07 student student interaction is significant with 0.102 perception is also very strong 0.441 and 0.392 is the beta which is the significant so this way we can understand the relationship between each of the independent variable with the uh, dependent variable okay so this is another we will understand how far but there are some outlier in the histogram so this way we will see the major things here and we will try to understand how good is our model and what is the relationship between dependent variable and the independent variable so uh, so that is one thing about the regression and uh, now after regression we have come to the last leg of this so basically i have covered some of the spss tool i have told you about what is uh, basic spss screen how does it look like how is the platform then we see then we have seen the um, how to do you know uh, your uh, efa then we have seen how to do the reliability and then how to do the regression so that's all from my side for this session so if you have any question you can ask me thank you uh thank you so much ma'am for the session we'll uh, wait for a minute or so to see if uh, we have a question or so i asked the participants in case they have a question they can uh, raise the hand so we have one question ma'am uh 
just allowing this to close. Uh, yes, Mr. Suresh, you can have uh, you can ask the question. Thank you so much. Mr. Suresh, uh, can you hear my voice? I guess we have lost him. We have one other person, Ms. Aditi Rai. Uh, Ms. Aditi, if you can hear me, you can ask your question. Uh, this is not Aditi, this is Aditi's father. Dr. Rai, this side. Oh, oh. yes. <laughs> Dr. Mahasvita Sah, my question is that there is so many platforms available like SPSS, Python, Jupyter, SAS. If I try to figure out the data exploration and data visualization and data pre-processing step, so how would you rate SPSS as compared to SAS? Okay, so um... It is not about rating, it's about in which uh, tool you are more comfortable and which tool you can understand better and which tool you will be able to present well in your research paper. So right now, I may not rate that, but definitely as I use SPSS, AMOS and R more, so I would definitely treat AMOS and PLS better than SPSS. SAS, I'm not sure much about it because SAS will not give you a SCM kind of a structural equation modeling forum, which is AMOS gives. So that will be my answer for your question. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, thank, thank you so you. much for the wonderful session that we had today. Thank you for your insights. And I guess since SPSS is one of the most essential tools when it comes to research, uh, I believe the simplified way in which you have explained today are, uh, is definitely going to help the uh, academicians who are here today a lot. Thank you so much for your valuable time. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be with you all. Thank you so much. So I will log out right now. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. I thank all the participants as well who were here with us on the occasion of Pasant Panchami. Thank you so much for your presence and participation. Uh, hope you all have a good day. Thank you so much for your participation.